The day has finally come, mere mortals. If you're a surfer, scuba diver, swimmer, sailor, or cruise ship connoisseur, then rejoice, because today we're discussing the patron god of your craft, Poseidon. After more than four years of creating content about Greek mythology, discussing everything from the creation of the universe to gods that almost no one's heard of to that time where Zeus lost his throne to a bunch of birds, it is finally time to unpack the god of the seas messed up mythology. No doubt some of you are wondering why I waited so long to cover him, while the others watching are just wondering when this intro is going to be over, so I'll make it quick. The truth is, we've discussed Poseidon a lot in other episodes of this show. Is one of the Big Three, Poseidon plays a pivotal role in some of the most well-known Greco-Roman myths. The naming of Athens, the transformation of Medusa, the f***ing Odyssey, and at one point he even helped stage an uprising against Zeus, which doesn't go well. His pervasiveness in myth can be equated to the omnipresence of his domain. Roughly 70% of the earth is water, and eerily enough, 70% of Greek myths feature Poseidon. Not really, but wouldn't that be insane? He is in quite a few though, many of which we've discussed, so I've never felt any urgency to cover him because I always felt that anyone who watched our show already knew all the major stuff about him. But boy was I wrong. I gotta tell you, Zeus gets a lot of flack for being an adulterous horn dog, but Poseidon's body count gives him a serious run for his money. I mean, the dude had over 100 mortal children with different women. That's not even counting his divine offspring or the animals he sired. Suffice to say, this episode is going to get weirder than any of you expected, and the way that you think of Poseidon could be changed forever. First, though, I do want to say thanks to the friends who funded all the work that went into this episode, our sponsor, Cook Unity. I love cooking, but as someone who works a minimum of 60 hours a week, I just don't always have the half hour or hour of free time required to prepare a quality meal. That being said, I also don't want to sacrifice my health just because a gummy worm smoothie is more convenient than a steak, which is why I'm so glad I found Cook Unity. There are a ton of food delivery services and meal kit subscriptions out there, but what makes Cook Unity special is they're the first ever chef to consumer platform. A team of more than 50 chefs from some of the best restaurants in the country bring their signature dishes to your table every week. Here's how it works. When you sign up, you list the foods you like or don't and pick how many meals you want in a week. Then you choose from a curated list of hundreds of meals that's constantly having new options added to it. My wife and I had a diverse lineup from Mom's Sunday Sauce Rigatoni by New York chef John DeLucy to Chicken Teriyaki with Charred Broccolini by Chef Esther Choi in Brooklyn. No exaggeration, it was all delicious and as someone who's experimented with other food delivery services in the past, you can really taste the difference in quality. Because instead of your food being prepared in a mega warehouse production facility before it's sent out, Cook Unity chefs cook meals in a micro kitchen using real ingredients, nothing artificial. So when your meals are delivered, they're already fully cooked. All you have to do is warm them up in the oven or microwave. And the best part, no dishes. Cook Unity has saved us a ton of valuable time these past few weeks, and it can do the same for you. To try Cook Unity yourself, go to cookunity.com slash johnsolo, or click the link in the description and use my code johnsolo50 to get 50% off your first order. All right, so I think the best place to start this deep dive into Poseidon, pun intended, is with the story of his birth and ascension to godhood. Longtime watchers and my fellow mythology nerds are no doubt familiar with this story, but you've got to hear about the alternate timeline we stumbled across in our research. The classic story goes that after Poseidon's father Cronus castrated his father Uranus and tossed his balls into the ocean, Gaia, Mother Earth, told Cronus about a prophecy that one of his children would hijack his shiny new throne from him. This freaked Cronus out considerably, so he tried to thwart this prophecy the only way he knew how, by literally swallowing any children that his wife Rhea gave birth to. This was an alright plan at first, but when kid number six came around, Rhea had grown tired of giving up her babies to this monster. So she swapped out the infant Zeus with a rock, which Cronus promptly swallowed. Meanwhile, she entrusted Zeus with some nymphs who secretly raised him to adulthood without Cronus knowing. At least that's the mainstream version of events written by the Greek poet Hesiod in his work The Theogony. But did you know there's another version where Rhea saves Poseidon from being swallowed as well? I had never heard this one before, but apparently Pausanias, a geographer from ancient Greece, 
wrote about this variant in his work, Descriptions of Greece. He says that in the city of Arcadia, they believe that instead of Rhea feeding Poseidon directly to Cronus, she hid him among a flock of sheep and he was raised there among the lambs. But here's my favorite part. Instead of her craftily giving Cronus a baby-sized rock to swallow like she later would when Zeus was born, with Poseidon, she lied and said she gave birth to a horse then offered up a little foal for Cronus to swallow. On the one hand, I feel horrible for that little pony, but on the other, I find it kind of hilarious that she made Cronus swallow something with hooves. You gotta wonder what was going through Cronus's mind at that point. I would think that his wife birthing a horse after he sired four children without issue would raise a red flag or two, but I guess his arrogance got the better of his judgment. We'll give him a pass though, because he was the first guy to go through something like that. He's not like us where he had the wisdom of his ancestors to rely on or reruns of Mori to watch when he was homesick from school. Anyway, whichever of Poseidon's births you prefer, the rest of his ascension story matches up exactly with what you've heard in the past. Sometime later, when Zeus had grown to his full strength, he infiltrated his father's retinue of servants and served him a chalice that was laced with a puking potion. Cronus drank the whole thing without hesitation and proceeded to vomit up the four or five children he swallowed in reverse order. No word on what happened to the horse though. I'm assuming because he wasn't immortal, he came out the other end. <laughs> After the second birth of Hestia, Demeter, Hera, and Hades, they joined forces with Poseidon and Zeus to bring an end to the reign of the Titans. But make no mistake, even with their powers combined, this was no easy feat. In fact, Zeus had to recruit his uncles, Cronus' brothers, the Cyclopes, to lend their blacksmithing skills to the war effort, which is how he, Hades, and Poseidon ended up with their iconic weapons, the Thunderbolt, the Invisibility Helm, and of course, the Trident, meant to represent the three-pronged fisherman spear. For the next 10 years, the reborn Olympians and Titans waged war for control of the cosmos. Everyone involved shed blood, sweat, tears, and ambrosia, but in the end, the Olympians came out on top. And to punish the Titans for their wicked ways, they were cast down into Tartarus. Meanwhile, Zeus and his brothers drew lots to decide their respective domains. Zeus wound up with the sky, Hades with the underworld, and Poseidon became god of the sea. But what exactly does that mean, God of the Sea? Is he just an Aquaman who receives sacrifices, or is there more to it than that? Honestly, if we're talking about his godly powers, then comparing Poseidon to Aquaman is not that far off. Poseidon had lordship over all the world's oceans as well as their inhabitants and could influence them to behave however he saw fit. Like in the case of legendary Greek artist Arian, who was supposedly rescued by a dolphin and wrote a hymn of thanks to Poseidon after the event. If he was in a good mood, he could calm the sea and even pull up new islands from the ocean deep. But when he was offended, he caused floods, drownings, shipwrecks, droughts, and earthquakes. Earthquakes might sound kind of random, but in those days, natural philosophers like Aristotle believed that earthquakes were caused by the erosion of rocks by rivers, lakes, and oceans. So that fell into Poseidon territory. It was obviously better for everyone when the gods were appeased, so sailors heading out on a voyage would pray and make sacrifices to Poseidon with the hope that he'd bless them with a smooth and successful journey. Success ranging from lucrative fishing trips to victorious naval campaigns. Pausanias wrote of some fishermen in Corcyra failing to catch any fish until they sacrificed a bull to Poseidon, and there's written record of Alexander the Great pausing at the Syrian seashore before the Battle of Issus to invoke Poseidon the sea god for whom he ordered a four-horse chariot be cast into the waves. With such an all-encompassing domain, it probably won't surprise you to hear that sacrifices like these took place throughout all of Greece. Temples and shrines to Poseidon have been found in a number of major cities, but like any god, he did have a primary center of worship the city of Corinth. Corinth is where the Isthmian Games were held in honor of Poseidon. This festival took place in the spring during the years before and after each Olympic Games and featured similar contests like foot races, horse races, wrestling, and boxing. Only men competed in the athletic portion, but unlike the Olympics, this festival included musical and poetical contests that women were allowed to enter. How progressive. Another blessing the mere mortals in ancient Greece owed Poseidon thanks for was empowering the empire's economy. A ton of trade took place in naval ports with every kind of good you can imagine being imported by boat. So kingdoms that had easy access to the sea gave special thanks to Poseidon. But that didn't necessarily make him their most important god. Case in point, 
Athens. For those unaware, according to myth, Athens used to go by a different name, Cecropia. It was named after its leader, a half-man, half-snake named Cecrops, who had led the city into prosperity. The Olympians considered Cecropia the most beautiful city in all of Greece, and as a result, both Poseidon and Athena wanted dominion over it. But because the gods were terrible at compromising, Zeus announced that there would be a contest to decide the city's patron. Poseidon and Athena would each bless Cecropia with a gift, and whoever's gift the Cecropians found more beneficial would be declared the victor. Depending on the version, Poseidon's gift could be one of two things. In one variant, he gave them a horse, an animal that was sacred to him on account of the foal that sacrificed its life so he could avoid being eaten by his father. The other variant, which by my estimation is a lot more popular, states that Poseidon struck the earth with the points of his trident, causing a stream of salt water to enter the city. Just like that, Cecropia's real estate value went way up. With easy access to the water, they'd become a central hub of trading to the many cities surrounding the Mediterranean and make a ton of money as a result. Sounds like an easy dub for Poseidon, right? Well, not exactly, because Athena planted the very first olive tree, which on the surface might not sound like much, but the Cecropians were a smart people and knew the olive tree could provide them with wood, oil, and fruit. As a result, Athena was declared the winner, and Cecropia took her name, officially becoming the City of Athens. Although, this story is a little misleading because experts actually think Athena got her name from the city and not the other way around. Regardless, Poseidon may have been the loser, but his gift was not forgotten. The Athenians still honored him as one of their chief civic gods, and our friend Pausanias said that altars dedicated to him could be found in Athenian temples, so he still got plenty of love. Or bloody bull carcasses. Same thing. One cannot talk about Poseidon without mentioning the Iliad and the Odyssey. Your boy plays a notable role in both. If you saw my recent episode about the times where Zeus almost lost his crown, then you'll remember there was one occasion where Hera rallied together some of her fellow Olympians to try and take down the big man. In book one of the Iliad, there's a line that references this event, which doesn't go well. Hera, Poseidon, Athena, and Apollo had tried to put Zeus in chains while he was asleep but one of his attendants, Thetis, alerted his buddies, the Hecatonchores, about what was going down. When the Olympians heard the stomps of the Hecatonchores approaching, they all dropped the chains and ran in different directions, but unfortunately Zeus caught them all and punished them. Well, not Athena, she was his favorite, but his wife? He threw Hera in the same chains that she had tried to trap him in, chained anvils to her feet, and suspended her from the heavens, forcing her to stare into the chaotic void filled with horrors even their immortal brains couldn't comprehend. As for Poseidon and Apollo, their sentence wasn't as intense, but it wasn't fun either. They were consigned to living for a year as powerless mortals in the indentured servitude of King Laomedon who is, for lack of a better term, a total goofbag. Check this out. Laomedon enlists mortal Apollo and mortal Poseidon to help him build the walls of Troy, and over the next year, they did. But when they went to the king to collect their payment, he told them the walls weren't that nice anyway, and they should have just done it for the exposure. Oh, and he also said he'd cut off their hands and feet and sell them into slavery if they ever brought up the payment again. But I can't think of a more worthless slave than one who's just had his hands and feet cut off. A logical threats aside, Laomedon didn't realize he was speaking with two of the most powerful, vengeance-loving gods in the entire pantheon, and they were eager to use the powers they had just gotten back. So, after leaving the city, Apollo shot a single arrow laced with disease over its walls, and soon enough, Trojan citizens, soldiers, and statesmen were dropping dead left and right. The small percentage of people with healthy immune systems weren't any better off, though. Poseidon had sent a sea monster to devour anyone looking too happy with their lives. This dispute with the Trojans is why Poseidon would later side with the Greeks during the Trojan War he was still feeling cheated from having to build those big, beautiful walls for free. Granted, before the Trojan War started, Heracles had passed through Troy, slaughtered Laomedon and all of his heirs, and put a new king on the throne, so Poseidon didn't really have a right to be mad at them still. 
but maybe he just wanted to see those walls come crashing down. The Lord of the Sea didn't stay on the Greek side for long though. After they had won the war, he felt like they had handled their victory without honor or grace. I know I just said he wanted the walls of Troy to come crashing down, but perhaps watching Greek soldiers carve unborn babies out of their mothers and punt them over those walls left a bad taste in his mouth. Not only were the Greek soldiers dishonorable in their victory, but one particular Greek, a king named Odysseus, made an enemy out of Poseidon on his journey home from the war. His blasphemous behavior? Blinding the sea god's son, the Cyclops Polyphemus. But in Odysseus's defense, Polyphemus had trapped the king and his crew in a cave and eaten a handful of them so Odysseus was simply acting out of self-preservation. Poseidon didn't care about that, though. He punished Odysseus by throwing every possible danger into his path, and by the time the king finally made it home, his entire crew had perished, and ten years had passed since the war's end. Poseidon's relationship with the kings of Greece is obviously a strained one, but if you thought his treatments of Laomedon and Odysseus were harsh, just listen to what he did to his nephew, King Minos. Then leave a comment telling me if you think he deserved it or not. Some context, Minos was one of the three sons of Zeus and Europa, and all three of them were adopted and raised by Asterion. No, not the sassy vampire from Baldur's Gate. F*** that guy. I'm talking about the Cretan King Asterion. When he passed away, there was debate over which of his three stepsons would succeed him, and Minos insisted it was the god's will that he be king, and to prove it, he said that whatever he prayed for would come true. Now, when Minos said that, he had no idea how he was going to prove it. That's the type of guy Minos was. He'd agree to any deal that benefited him, even if he didn't know how to fulfill his end of it. With this in mind, he made a prayer to his uncle Poseidon and said, If you can convince my dumb, loyal subjects that I should be king, I'll make the biggest, juiciest sacrifice you've ever received. Poseidon, now having something to gain from the situation, foolishly took Minos' word and agreed to help. So when the wannabe king had a big crowd gathered around him, he signaled to the water god. And at that moment, a great white bull rose out of the sea. This sent the crowd around Minos into a frenzy. Like an audience at a David Blaine show, their minds were blown out the back of their skulls. What the F? How what? did you, how did he get it? Where I, to, to the Cretan citizens, the choice was obvious. The gods wanted Minos to be king, so that's what he'd be. I wish that I could say everyone in Crete lived happily ever after, but you should know by now that happy endings aren't allowed in Greek mythology. King Minos officially had everything he ever wanted, and all he had to do was keep his end of the bargain with Poseidon. Only, now that he saw the great white bull with his own eyes, he found it too beautiful to give it back. Instead, he tried sacrificing some regular, everyday shitty bulls, which infuriated Poseidon. And as punishment, he cursed the great white bull with an uncontainable rage. This forced Minos to set the beautiful beast free, endangering the lives of his citizens and making him look like a helpless, powerless peon in the process. But this level of humiliation wasn't enough for Poseidon, so he also made Minos' wife fall in love with the bull. And you already know what love means in Greek mythology. If someone loves something, they probably want to fuck it. And that was the case with Queen Pasiphae. In fact, she wanted to do the deed so badly that she recruited Greece's most famous inventor, Daedalus, to design a contraption she could wear that would fool the bull into mounting her. And Daedalus, never one to pass on a challenge, accepted this commission. The union of Pasiphae and the Cretan bull led to the birth of Asterius, the infamous Minotaur, as well as Minos becoming the laughingstock of his own kingdom. If you want to hear the full story of the Minotaur, I recommend you check out my episode on the messed up origins of Icarus from a few years ago because I cover it in even greater detail. But for today's purposes, I just want to skip to the end. Because while some of you might find Poseidon to be cruel and unusual for doling out such a punishment, I've got to give him credit for helping solve the problem by siring the hero who would slay the Minotaur, Theseus. Funnily enough, something similar happened when Poseidon sent Cetus, the sea monster, to ravage the land of Ethiopia. This was a punishment for Queen Cassiopeia's boasting that her daughter Andromeda was more beautiful than the Nereids. To placate Poseidon, Andromeda was chained to a rock as a sacrifice to the beast. But before it could devour her, Poseidon's nephew Perseus showed up and saved her. Perseus just happened to be passing by after slaughtering Medusa. He was headed back to Seraphos with her head in his hand when he heard Andromeda's cries and took it upon himself to save the day. But while we're on the subject of Medusa, I think now's a good time to discuss the prolific love life of the seamen. 
I mean, the sea god. No exaggeration, I could make a full-length episode dedicated to Poseidon's love life. Actually, since we're approaching the end of our Olympian deep dives, I think that'd be a fun new series to do with all the gods. Let me know what you think about that idea in the comments. In the meantime, I'm going to share with you the insanity that is Poseidon's body count. For starters, let's address the 100-plus offspring I mentioned in the intro. No, I'm not going to list them all, because I want to finish this episode before I die of old age. But how did the number get so high? An interesting bit of info that we found in our research is that some characters in Greek myth were assigned divine parents solely to emphasize their uniqueness and power. As a result of this practice, there weren't always myths to explain how Poseidon seduced and impregnated his lovers. His children were simply described as sons or daughters of Poseidon, and it's left at that. All this being said, there's a few choice myths that are either hilarious or horrifying that need to be shared. To set the stage a bit, Poseidon is married to Amphitrite, a sea nymph who was convinced to marry him after he sent a very persuasive dolphin to sweet talk her. The couple would go on to have three children, Triton, a fish-tailed sea god, a daughter, Rhodos, the divine personification of the island of Rhodes, and another daughter whose name I can't pronounce, but she doesn't do anything important anyway. Besides their children, there's nothing noteworthy about Poseidon and Amphitrite's relationship. Honestly, the most interesting thing about it is that unlike some other goddesses, she never seeks revenge for his many, many affairs, even when they involve his own sister. You heard that right. A lesser known detail from Demeter's search for Persephone is that somewhere along the way, Poseidon spotted Demeter walking alone. So what did he do when she was in this vulnerable state? Did he get her a warm blanket and some cocoa? Maybe lend her a shoulder to cry on? Nah, he made a pass at her instead. Hit her with the classic, Girl, I know your daughter's been missing for months now and you worry every day about her safety, but why not spend the night getting wet with me, the god of the sea? Big surprise, this approach was not appreciated, so Demeter transfigured herself into a horse to try and escape him, which sounds like a pretty clear rejection to me. But apparently Poseidon didn't think so, because he turned himself into a stallion, chased her down, and impregnated her with the horse deity, Arian. Let's hope that Demeter stayed in horse form during that birthing process. Otherwise, ouch. This wasn't the only time that Poseidon transformed himself to get some action, but this next instance sounds kind of unnecessary. Melantho was a princess and granddaughter of Prometheus. We know almost zero details about her relationship with Poseidon, except for this major one. He seduced her by turning into a dolphin. I know, I also have a million and one questions, but unless we dig up some new ancient texts, they're gonna stay unanswered. The only other detail I could track down is that the son that was born from their union was Delphoi, the god of dolphins. But in some versions, Apollo is his father, so that's not even consistent. I wish I could say this was the weirdest of Poseidon's hookups, but I think it's outmatched by this next one. In one of our recent shorts called Ares' Most Embarrassing Defeat, I discussed the Eloidae, the two giant sons of Poseidon who stormed the gates of Mount Olympus with the intention of abducting Artemis and Hera. Well, it turns out their mother, Iphimedea, was just as insane as they were and cared equally little about consent. Because when she wanted to have a baby with Poseidon, she didn't pray to the god or write a love letter and cast it into the ocean. Instead, she went down to the beach where the ocean waves met the shore, laid down with her legs spread, and simply allowed the ocean waves to fill her... You get the idea. I know it sounds crazy, but is it crazy if it works? Yep. Last but not least, we've got to talk about Poseidon's most infamous affair with the one and only Medusa. For those unaware, Medusa was a priestess of Poseidon's rival Athena, and as a priestess to a virgin goddess, she was expected to remain a virgin as well. Medusa had no reservations about keeping her vow of celibacy, but Poseidon had other plans. He'd taken a liking to Medusa and wanted to have her, whether she agreed to or not. One evening, when Medusa was alone in Athena's temple, Neptune appeared before her and tried making a move. Medusa refused his advances with all of her might, but he was a god and she was a mere mortal, so there wasn't much she could do but accept her fate and pray that her patron goddess would forgive her. 
Except that Athena wasn't really in the business of forgiveness. From her perspective, her once loyal priestess just broke a sacred vow with her bitter rival, so she had to be punished. She would have punished Poseidon if she could, but he was her uncle and one of the few gods with more power than her. So after Poseidon left and as Medusa laid there alone on the cold stone floor of the temple, Athena struck her with a very personal curse. Her nails extended into razor sharp claws, the beautiful priestess's legs morphed into a serpent tail, and her beautiful hair became a nest of angry snakes. The once gorgeous woman had been turned into a monster, and to ensure that she spent the rest of her life in lonely isolation, Athena made it so any man who looked into Medusa's eyes would turn to stone. No exaggeration, this might be the saddest story in all of Greco-Roman mythology. An innocent woman is assaulted, then punished for being a victim of said assault. Only, there's a little more to it than that. One cannot mention the Medusa story nowadays without bringing up the alternative interpretation that Athena wasn't punishing her, but protecting her. After Medusa became a Gorgon, there was no man on Earth or in the heavens who would dare to try to get romantic with her. And if for some reason they did, she now had the power to defend herself. It's a promising theory that makes the story a little less painful to listen to. But you want to know what makes it a lot less painful? The fact that, according to the Greeks, the whole Poseidon rape thing didn't even happen. To the ancient Greeks, Medusa was always a monster. Full stop. Her entire story consisted of Perseus cutting her head off and then using that head for various means, like killing monsters and freeing his mother from an abusive relationship with the king. Poseidon forcing himself on her was an addition made by the Roman poet Ovid in the first century BCE after the story had already been around for centuries. Besides Ovid, the only other writer to mention Poseidon in relation to Medusa is Hesiod, but he doesn't say she was assaulted. He says they lay together in a soft meadow and among spring flowers, which I'm pretty sure is not the kind of language a writer would use to describe a victim of sexual assault. In other texts, like the Bibliotheca, Athena transforms Medusa into a gorgon for daring to compare her beauty to the goddess, which is also messed up, but less pure evil. Whichever version you want to go with, I think we can all agree that the only good thing to come out of Poseidon and Medusa's relationship is Pegasus. After Perseus snuck into Medusa's lair and chopped her head off, her two sons by the sea god, Pegasus and Chrysaor, burst out of her neck. Popular culture would have you believe that Perseus then hopped on the back of Pegasus and rode him around Greece, but this was actually a change made by artists living in the classical period and became commonplace by the Middle Ages. In actuality, the real tamer of Pegasus was Poseidon's other son, Bellerophon, but that's a topic for another day. As for the Lord of the Sea, that's just about everything you could possibly know about his mythology. So with my job done, I'm gonna go take a nap. Just kidding, I'm gonna binge edit for the next 36 hours to get this behemoth done on time. Before I head out though, I just wanna kindly remind you that if you wanna support the work we do here, uncovering the messed up origins of your favorite mythology and folklore every single week, do us a favor and sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons to the gods. It costs you nothing and will actually raise the quality of your sub box and recommended feed because you'll get new content like this sent to you every Thursday and new short form content every weekday. I'll speak with you again and next week when I dive into the messed up origins of my favorite squirrel of all time. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.